just couldn't believe I was having Lauren Tagle sing to us. But the cool thing, we weren't just hearing it. All the mission control centers around the world were also hearing it. Hi, this is NASA astronaut Shane Kimbrough, and this is One Small Step for Mankind. <laughs> This is Shane. He's the commander of the International Space Station. And I just can't even imagine taking all the spacewalks that you did. You love to be active and out and about, but that's a whole nother story. Tell me about the first time you stepped off on that spacewalk and uh, how it was different from the last time. Wow. Well, there. I mean, it's, it's a crazy thing as you're kind of alluding to, right? Um, going out in the vacuum of space. The very first time is, um, it, honestly, it's not a whole lot different than the last because the stakes are so high, the dangers are so great. Um, and if you're not completely 100% focused um, going out that door, the hatch, as we call it, yeah. um, then, you know, things can go wrong. And so you're, uh, you really, for, for me, and, and I was taught this by other people, but really the first 10 to 15 minutes really are going to determine how the rest of the day is going to go. And so um, you rehearse it in your mind a thousand times. You rehearse it with the person you're going out with a you know, hundred times. And in the first 10 minutes is really where you're just getting set up. So you're going outside, you're hooking up your safety tethers, you're trying to get comfortable. Um, and if you're going out with a first timer, they're usually pretty yeah. jacked up, right? And really yeah. hyped up. And you you got to kind of kind of tone them down a bit because the more excited you are, honestly, the more resources you're using. So you have a limited supply mm -hmm. of oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide removal in your in your suit and you got to just maintain that kind of a steady pace in order to be able to last the six and a half seven and a half hours whatever it's going to be that day um and so we really harp on those first 10 to 15 minutes let's say from the first one to my last one which i've done nine i think yeah so um if you can get that right it really does set a great tone for the rest of the day for the not just for you outside, but for the, the incredible team that's supporting you in mission control um, and your crewmates on the space station that may be flying you around on the robotic arm or doing other things to support you. So it's a huge team effort and a lot of pressure on the two people going outside um, mm -hmm. because there's some important things you're doing. You may be fixing something that's that's been broken on the space station. You may be installing a new piece of equipment. All that's going to help prolong the life of the International Space Station. So you have a big task. Um, it's something that you've never done before, realistically, outside in the vacuum of space where things are floating around and are potentially floating around. And so you got to manage all that. You know, it doesn't always work. Sometimes things get let go, and that's unfortunate. Uh, it's happened on one of mine. And then, then the team has to kind of regroup and figure out, all right, how are we going to solve this problem or continue the mission and get it done with, with other resources. And, and NASA, the NASA team always comes through. Um, they're really at their finest when things aren't going the best. Um, and wow. you see that in movies and, and it really is true for the, for the team, the NASA team really comes through when the chips are down or when something has gone wrong um, and they still accomplish the mission. Unbelievable. And a shout out to Janet uh, at NASA for connecting us again. Uh, the last time that we saw each other, we were on a rooftop deck um, and you were perf uh, you, you were performing. You yeah. were there with um, sort of a singer songwriter showcase. I just love the diversity of who you are and, you know, the things that you have taken care of. Um, at the International Space Station are sort of like a laundry list on steroids. You know, you're talking about the repairs that have to be done outside the International Space Station, but you're also talking about things that have to be upgraded and very, very different spaces. You talked about it that day in Houston about just making it as pleasant as possible for astronauts. Yeah, we do, like you were talking about, we do a lot of different things, right? We got to keep the International Space Station going. I mean, it's like a you know massive office building, think of it like that, right? But we don't have teams that we can call in to fix the, the electricity or the toilet or anything that breaks. And so we are those people. Uh, we're trained very well. 
although you can't be trained for every situation. And so we absolutely rely on the mission control team on the ground. And we have several of those all around the globe, not just the one in Houston that everybody is, you know, thinks about, but we have one in Huntsville, Alabama that helps us run all of our um, experiments mm -hmm. uh, that we do, which is mostly what we do on the International Space Station now. And so that whole team is you're working throughout your day on an experiment. They're going to be the ones helping you out through that. Maybe a quarter of our time is spent doing maintenance. And you were kind of talking about that, just maintenance on a facility like you would on your house or your yeah. office building. And we have to do those, some of that preventative and some of that reactive. Um, and usually we need the help of the mission control team to do, to help us there as well. We have certain teams on the ground that train us in those areas, but um, they will be the ones that will write a procedure for us overnight and uh, we'll get to use it potentially the next day. And so it's an amazing Amazing, humbling experience to be really just a very small piece of this amazing um, team mm. that is accomplishing so much. Mm. Now, uh, one of the uh, maybe stark realities uh, that I didn't really think about was craving music as you're orbiting Earth. And did I read that it was over 3000 orbits of Earth? That's unreal that you're seeing the planet in that way. Um, and I remember you in Houston talking about a very specific um, time that you had with music. I'd love to hear that again, just about um, your connection in that. Was it like a little isolated pod that was suspended, right? And that's often a place where you would go and, and have quiet time or do devotions or, or read. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. The little, the module you're talking about is called the cupola. Um, it's all windows. It's a fantastic module that uh, we have. It's always on the bottom side of the space station. So it's always looking at earth. And so the, obviously the views um, and, the, and it is where I would go kind of the last, you know, hour, hour and a half of the day before I go to sleep, I try to get in there. Everybody's trying to get in there. So you gotta, gotta be a nice crew member and not take it all the time, but when I got the chance to do that, it's just a surreal space where you can just literally you're floating, looking at God's creation. Um, it's hard not to be taking pictures and videos, but sometimes you just got to put that aside and just sit there and enjoy the view, enjoy some music. You can play music, you can you know put whatever you want on, and those are those are special moments. Um, on the last mission too, I was in the the SpaceX spacecraft, which is what we flew up in. And that's what that was ended up being my sleep station as well, which is pretty unusual. But we had too many people on the space station for the sleep stations that we had. So I, you know, at first it didn't seem like I was the lucky one, but I ended up being the lucky one because that spacecraft had two beautiful windows that I I could just, you know, look at, take pictures out of, enjoy our planet whenever I had some free time. Uh, one of the most beautiful parts of your interaction, uh, you had talked with Lauren Daigle. Were you guys in a Zoom situation? Yeah, it was a it was a two way video uh -huh. that we got to do, um, and it was her, it was actually her podcast that she was doing. And I think the theme of her podcast those years were, if I wasn't a singer, what would I want to be? And it wanted to talk to people like that, and uh, mm -hmm. one of them was <laughs> being an astronaut, and so. We've been connected before. I got to the the privilege of touring um, her and her teammates around NASA one time and get to share the whole kind of behind the scenes um, things with her. And then as a result of that, we stayed in touch a little bit. And when I was going up on the last mission, she said, hey, I'm doing this podcast. You think we could do it from space? And I said, yeah, let's go for it. So uh, it all worked out. Uh, I didn't know if it, you, know, you never know if those things will always work out, but Right. Um, you know, the satellites were scheduled well and everything worked out the, the, uh, it was just really neat kind of talking to her and, you know, and her, she and her team, as they were interviewing me and talking to me would just be giggling in the back because some, something would float by or somebody mm -hmm. else would float by, you know, just things that you don't normally see. And it was, it was really neat to hear the excitement in her voice. And, uh, at the end, I got my whole crew to come in and kind of just tackled each other and we're floating like this floating <laughs> ball of people and. <laughs> um, she just thought that was the greatest thing. So it was really neat to interact with her. Very, very special. And I'll tell you, Lauren Daigle and her team and Lee over there just adore all the things that you have done with them and for them. And it's such a special thing. The The part that touched me that uh, you shared was when you were sitting in that uh, cupola mm -hmm. and when she sang, I just remember you just staring at earth 
and her through this two way, just hearing the music of earth come to space for you. That was so beautiful. Super special. Um, it was, you know, it was not part of the script. It wasn't, she wasn't planning. It was early in the morning for her, as I remember. So she had certainly not warmed up or anything. And she said, Hey, is there anything we can do for you guys? And I said, how about sing a song? <laughs> you know, can you sing to us? Yeah. And uh, she had just, Tremble had just come out mm -hmm. and had the single Tremble. And so I said, how about Tremble? <laughs> and, which is a big voice song, as you know, as most yeah. of her songs are, but she sang that so beautifully. And um, even crewmates of mine that weren't around were throughout the space station that were hearing it. And they started kind of coming to where I was like, who is this? <laughs> you know? Yes. Amazing. Um, and a really neat piece of that story. Of course, I enjoyed it. Like I said, I was looking out a beautiful window and just couldn't believe I was having Lauren Tagle sing to us. But the cool thing, we weren't just hearing it. All the mission control centers around the world were also hearing it. So that was really special. And then after the event happened, I was working on an experiment, actually. And the person from Huntsville, Alabama that I was working with just said, hey, before you get going, I got to tell you, uh, Lauren Daigle is my favorite. And I was listening to that and I was just blown away and super moved by by that experience. So thanks for <laughs> thanks for letting me listen along. I had no idea the impact that you know that moment would have on so many other people. Amen. Uh, Lee was just saying how Lauren Daigle's mission is to fill stadiums and that at the sound of Lauren Daigle's voice, people would be healed. And um, I just think those are two really amazing uh, strengths. And I feel like the opportunity for her to fill some stadiums mm -hmm. of um, folks at NASA, you know, just uh, they're experiencing what you experienced is such yeah. a great mission. We'll never know. And I mean, it's hard to even put into words, but uh, we only get to do a few of those kind of things in, in a six month period. Right. And so yeah. to have that kind of just energy boost for me personally, for my family who was listening as well and our crewmates, I mean, it, that just, you know, I won't say, I'm sure we were going through a hard month or whatever. And that just kind of gave us that extra energy and God just kind of gave us wings to continue to fly and, and press on. And um, yeah. with a great attitude, you know, just really gave us a nice morale boost, which is an unintended consequence of something like that. But it's so special mm -hmm. for, for the crew members up there and for our families um, to, to hear things like that. I love that. One thing your wife had said, which was so fun, one of the questions was, what's the hardest thing for you to get used to when you come back to Earth? And your answer was quickly gravity. And um, your wife had talked about um, uh, changing all the dishes out to paper um, because you would reach for a coffee cup and then you'd reach for something else <laughs> like I would fall to the ground. Uh, wow, just uh, really... Um, Experience, unfortunately, because you're used to just letting something go. I mean, your brain is wired that way. That's your new normal of being in microgravity. And then gravity is not that way. So if you let something go, obviously it's going to fall to the ground. But we, so we we were breaking a lot of plates and glasses on my <laughs> mission. So Robbie's way ahead of the game this time to, to have plastic cups and paper plates. So. I love that. Oh, well, all the best to you and Robbie. So appreciate you Thank guys you. and your hearts. And um I just, uh, I'm just taken with your story and I'm grateful that you had a chance to share a little bit of it today. Thank you for having me and uh, we'll hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Hello, I'm NASA astronaut Shane Kimbrough and you're watching Bandkind. Awesome. I love it. We just got our trademark in from the United States Patent and Trademark Office. One small step for mankind. I actually said that live on the radio after COVID, uh, a bunch of uh, musicians came through. You probably know Toby Mac, right. um, but they were the first large tour that went out and everyone came back healthy. And literally on the air, I said, I feel like this is one small step for mankind. Right. And I was just like, what? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So Are you in Nashville? Spent a lot of years in Nashville, overhauling music and renovating houses and the whole nine. Uh, love Nashville, and it always will be like a second home to me. Thank you so much, Shane. I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, thank Bye. you.